Right, good. So we're going to talk a little bit about insomnia today. This is a, a really what we see from primary care. It's not going to be the specialist, you know, Wu Tang dancing master of, of insomnia treatments. That's uh, that's Dr. Ahmed, but it'll be sort of an overview of the topic. So the diagnosis of insomnia requires one or more of the following difficulty initiating sleep, maintaining sleep, waking up too early, or sleep is chronically non-restorative or poor in quality. So how many people had uh, that? Oh yeah, okay, everybody has had that. Everybody has that every now and then. Sleep difficulty discurs despite adequate opportunity and circumstances for sleep. Okay, I don't know if you'd have uh, Insomnia in a war zone, that would not happen. So those are always interesting. Insomnia is a, not sleep deprivation, but the two may coexist. And there are daytime consequences, inattention noticeable by others, myself and others. So the key here is the daytime consequences. Uh, and that's what makes it a, quote, disorder rather than uh, just a set of symptoms, which many people think uh, outside of sleep medicine, that it's just a set of symptoms and that we sort of are, are symptom doctors. It's associated with daytime impairment and people have to have at least one of these things, fatigue, malaise, tension, social, dis vocational dysfunction, mood disturbance, daytime uh, sleepiness, motivational energy, proneness, tension, headaches. GI symptoms and concerns are worried about sleep. Now, none of these are very specific. They're common in the population. 30% of all patients that present the primary care physicians for the first time have a complaint of fatigue. And so <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty wild. And so all these things really are, 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 are kind of make this. And does that mean that we get to take care of the entire world? Well, it could be. And so if you want to think of it that way as a market share, we should probably have all these things around us that people can buy before they come into the office in our waiting rooms that we can make a higher margin than our seeing patients for insomnia. Well, not really. Okay. So what, what do people know about it? There, there, there's a long history of looking at insomnia. It's something that primarily kind of came out of, of, of psychology. Uh, Tom Roth was probably the major person that uh, drove this field in the 80s. Uh, he was also one of the major people that uh, sort of operationalized the study of insomnia using, uh, using a variety of tools in describing different types. And these are the things, impacts the quality of life, predisposes patients to recurrence, that is, the, if you have insomnia, that's the primary risk factor for having another bout of insomnia. And it may continue despite treatment of the primary condition. And then insomnia at one time was called secondary insomnia if it occurred in the setting of another condition, but it's now in ICD, uh, ICSD-3. It's actually uh, considered to be a, a separate disorder if it has a distinct and individual and, and recognizable impact on a person's behavior. So if you have insomnia in the setting of depression, you can have both uh, depression and insomnia as a comorbid or as, as conditions in the same patient. And a lot of that got worked out in the 90s and uh, uh, aughts, as they say. So in the general population, there's 10 to 15% that have chronic insomnia five to seven nights a week. But at any one point in time, there's about 40% of the population, which means you don't really have to ask people about it. It's so common, you, you could throw a dart and say, oh, well, that person has insomnia. It's clinical prevalence though in, in, in primary care, uh, is higher than it is in sleep clinics. The reason is, is that, uh, that there are so many uh, other conditions that produce insomnia. 
And that's probably one of the reasons why primary care providers don't want to ask about sleep is because it's so common and what to do about it is really quite rudimentary from a primary care point of view. The prevalence of primary insomnia, that is insomnia that is unrelenting and, and really not associated with any other condition is about 20% of all cases. And the, the major group that described that, and if you really want to look at that is Roth's work. And he did both sleep clinic based studies as well as some large uh, EMR studies in Henry Ford Hospital that tried to get at what was the people that just had insomnia, just had insomnia and didn't have really anything else. You could rule out everything else. Now we used to sort of say that that insomnia was one that started when you were a child or could be recognized as long as you could remember that sort of is the term people use. But insomnia for its comorbidity accounts for more than 80% of the cases. So when we encounter somebody with insomnia and they, they are sent to us for insomnia, you need to expect that they have something else and that that something else may not be explicit to the private, to the referring physician or even to the patient themselves. So these are risks. So female sex, increasing age, comorbid uh, illnesses, comorbid psychiatric disease, lower socioeconomic status, race, widow, divorce, and non-traditional work schedules. These are the at risk. There are a bunch as broad written. Now, what that means is that there are lots of people that have insomnia that come from the, with these risk factors, but there are also lots of people with these risk factors that don't have insomnia. And there really hasn't been a lot of work in finding out, you know, let's pick these populations that are really at risk and, and how many really sleep well. And Sushil, that's one of the reasons I sort of like that are you sated? Because uh, the idea you could pick up people who are sleeping well, despite all the things that we as sleep docs say could destroy your sleep uh, by risk factors, it'd be nice to sort of know what they're doing right or if they're just ignoring it. So that's an interesting sort of way of thinking about it. Got it. Why insomnia is a disorder. So this really uh, required some heavy lifting because it had to lift it out of being a symptom-based condition and something that you would uh, either treat with a pill, uh, which was going on for years and years. My grandmother used to take meprobamate at night when she had insomnia. She didn't have it all the time. But she had a bout of insomnia for a couple of weeks. She'd take meprobamate, she'd take barbiturates. And that was in the 50s and 60s. So it's the relative consistency of these cross comorbid conditions. The course of insomnia does not consistently co-vary with one comorbid disorder. Insomnia responds to different types of treatment than the comorbid disorder. And insomnia responds to the same types of treatment across different comorbid disorders. And insomnia poses a common risk for development of poor outcomes. If, if I had a pro-con debate in these fellows, I'd have one and say insomnia is a disorder and insomnia is not a disorder. And it'd be nice to have people debate this, but uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, this was the major heavy lifting by psychologists in the, what was then the American Sleep Disorders Association to try to convince people that it's a disorder and not just something that was that was part of, uh, of life or that it was uh, really a, a kind of a, a behavioral personality trait. So, um, and this is where it comes from. This is a, a slide in which the bars represent either no insomnia or the, the, uh, the red is insomnia. And this is from a, another you know, art study with all these different conditions. And you can find that insomnia is enriched when you have any of these things, heart disease, cancer, neurologic disease, breathing, pain, any problem, things of that sort. 
but where there may be 80% of people with any problem that have some insomnia, there is a group there uh, of about 40% that don't have insomnia, or at least we're not recognized at that point in time. Because everyone has a bad night's sleep, uh, often a couple times in a row. And so this is a single, uh, and then this is a single center study, not a large group, uh, but this is in Tucson, Arizona. And this is the presence of a health problem and no health problem if you had insomnia. So if you had insomnia, you could find a variety of people that had these issues. Now, if I flip back and forth, and you can remember the previous slide, that this is not the exact same listing. And it's interesting that to sort of know how those things kind of go together. It's not, it's, it makes sense that uh, car cardiovascular disease, arthritis, obesity, uh, osteoarthritis, other diseases uh, would, would be found in patients with insomnia. But the, uh, if you go from the other end, that is going from a clinic going from a clinic with diabetes or going with a clinic and GI problems is that you, uh, you, 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 it's a different group, different population. And so the other is a uh, proportion of respondents reporting any insomnia, uh, the number of medical comorbidity. And this is community dwelling subjects again. And notice where it's published, it's psychosomatic research. And I think, you know, the, the, the sort of things that you dig out of those studies, and this is considered to be a fairly foundational, uh, you know, sort of prevalence and kind of the scope of the issue. And part of that, trying to define it as a disorder. So psychiatric disorders are the most common condition comorbid with insomnia. So those are the medical conditions. These are the psychiatric disorders. There are DSM-4, and I think what, there's a five down, the distribution of insomnia. This is a, a Ohio is, a, is an interesting read. If you pull up a bunch of his studies, he was a trained, uh, well not trained, he's an interested guy in epidemiology and sleep medicine. He was at Stanford for a couple of years. And he developed uh, a telephone survey, which was a phone trip. Yes. Do you have sleep problems? Yes. No? That's it. <laughs> you have sleep problem? Yes. And then it went down and all these sorts of things. And he could call up a bunch of things. So he did it by country. He did it by European country. And uh, ended up with this 20,000 telephone uh, tree things. And could be able to find this particular thing in the community. Now, you, if you're sitting in a bipolar clinic, you're going to have lots of insomnia at times. If you're sitting in a depression clinic, you are. But this is the comorbid for insomnia. So they went down with insomnia, and then they went down. So you have to kind of know which way they went in terms of trying to do case, or at least to do point estimates for this particular issue, which is psychiatric disorder is the most common condition comorbid with insomnia. So the first thing was insomnia, and then what do you have as a psychiatric diagnosis? So the relative risk for psychiatric disorders associated with insomnia. So this is the other way of looking at it. And uh, depression, anxiety, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, other psychiatric disorders. But what's interesting about this is whether or not they were asking the question of whether or not you could use insomnia as an entree to be able to, to either pre to preemptively diagnose or to prevent psychiatric disorders because of the coexistence, particularly of depression and insomnia. And uh, I, I'm not sure how much traction uh, the concept is, but Roth would always say that insomnia is to depression as insulin resistance is to diabetes. 
And so he would say not everybody with insulin uh, with insulin um, uh, resistance would get diabetes, but most people with diabetes went through a period of insulin resistance. So I think that that that's a, a the, and so are are there any supporting evidence for that? And I, I found this slide. Let's see. Well, here the timing of insomnia related to the onset. So yellow is insomnia appears first, the red is insomnia appears together, and, and blue is the insomnia, uh, the disorder, that is whatever they had, new mood, recurrent mood, new anxiety, recurrent anxiety, and it occurs last. And, and you know, it's, it's not a unitary, a unitary uh, relationship. So insomnia coming first with a new mood disorder, recurrent mood disorder, and uh, coexisting. And, and these again are, you know, because of the numbers here, you can see that they had to ask very broad questions and, and go down through a phone tree to be able to sort this out. And so while this is, uh, you know, you could quibble with it and say, well, that's maybe not what I see in my practice or this is not what people are telling us. That at that time in 2003, Tom Roth was a member of the WHO World Health Organization and trying to get sleep as being one of their one of their target international conditions. And, and this is why this came out is that people said you have no data in large populations and communities. So what was there beforehand? Well, this is uh, this some of the Sushil probably seen before. This is insomnia and later life depression. And you see it's a 40 year timeline. And this is the number of men included in each time point. And so 1997, so you say, wow, in 1997, somebody asked a question or looked at a questionnaire. And that was 40 years earlier so that would be, you know, 1957. And so who were these people? And the question was, do you have insomnia, yes or no? And these were medical students at Johns Hopkins University. And this is then their 40, about 15 years after they, they came out of that period of their medical training. They started to show if they had insomnia before, more uh, insomnia. And so that's, that's kind of like something to keep in your head. And when you see somebody that presents at age 35 uh, with insomnia, that the idea, or depression even, that the idea that their insomnia was uh, was there. That's why you kind of take it. You know, at, at, I don't know if you do it on the first visit. We'll talk about the timing of taking histories, but at some point you need to kind of drop into well, how were you were you when you were a teenager, and how were you when you were a young adult, and what did you do, and how did you sleep? So the objective, which means you do sleep studies, we don't do sleep studies right now. It's not an indication for. Uh, for a PSG is to present with insomnia. But uh, you can see in this 1992, they were, that's what people could do in the 80s. You know, you could do PSGs. And, and you did about two of them a month, which was even two or three a month. You may have done a research one every now and then. You didn't do a lot. But this is the total sleep time. This is the sleep efficiency, sleep latency, slow wave sleep. And REM sleep and mood was really the, the latency. And the latency to, to, to REM sleep became a real issue. I, I don't know if it's, I think there is going to be a resurgence. We'll talk at the end about doing PSGs and people with insomnia and understanding what's going on. Um, but the decrease in REM sleep is, is one that is, uh, is really intriguing in terms of mood disorders and and certainly other psychiatric disorders. This really hasn't gotten a lot of attention. So there's bi-directional relationship. That's what that says. I don't know how I can get rid of this thing up there. 
Put it down here. That's good. And so what else is there? But there are other things that are there in, the, in each of these conditions. There are changes at ACTH, and there are, there are indications that there are hypothalamic uh, factors, uh, such as changes in temperature over a 24-hour period, uh, CRF, and other sorts of, uh, of, of kind of diurnal changes. And I'm surprised that, well, I'm not surprised because it's expensive, but we used to put people into the GCRC and measure blood every hour, every sometimes every 10 minutes, that there haven't been sort of proteomics and really clean insomnia versus not insomnia. Because I bet there are other things that are there. I don't think they're acute brain things, but I think that these are chronic uh, hormonal subtle changes um, that occur. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm still on that. Oh. Patients with pain. Let's see. Prevalence by age. Now, this is really interesting. I put it in quotes because uh, older people expect to have insomnia. And, and the problem you have here, this was in 1985, there came out the Nurses' Study of Sleep in Washington, in which they, they were part of, a, part of a, a, a grant that tried to look at elite elderly. So they took 5,000 people over the age of 85 in Washington. And they had everyone examined for medical conditions. And they found eight people that had nothing, had nothing. These are the barefoot skiers at age 85. These are the people that are still active. And they found their sleep was just like that of the 30-year-old. So they really sat there and said that there's a lot of problems that go with age that are not just chronological, but that is the comorbidity that, that is a important factor. Obviously in pain, if we could treat people better with pain, we probably could have better sleep. And I'm surprised, at one point there was a big push uh, when they could grandfather in for taking sleep boards. A lot of the pain people um, grandfathered in for sleep. And some of the pain people come and take sleep because they know if they take care of sleep, they take care of pain. And there are studies showing the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea improves pain for osteoarthritis and for other arthritis, arthritis, uh, arthritis conditions. Sorry. So these are the things that you get. These are not, you know, surprising. But again, this is another, uh, based on a survey of 19,000 people. So there's, it, it's probably, a, you know, it's, it's all right. So it's not just in your own group, and, and, and that's really the model. Sleep and cancer. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, Samina knows a lot about this. You, we, we, we first sort of dragged her in because we could say she could take care of this problem that's insomnia in cancer patients. I don't know to what extent that practice is still strong. Samina, do you have a comment about this? You're, you're we, um, we, we started the discussions and planned everything, then everything was paused and then COVID happened. So really nothing came of it in terms of um, setting up treatment, but I still get referrals um, one-on-one -on -one from the individual oncologist. Yeah. So, I mean, this is this is really a, a, this is really a, an interesting area from uh, also an idea about how does insomnia occur and what does it do. And one of the models for drug studies in insomnia is uh, and one that uh, Roth was very inventive about drug studies for insomnia and would try to create insomnia in people. 
and, and did a lot of inventive things in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but one of his more kind of real world was to take women who had, had a biopsy from a breast lump and follow their sleep until they uh, got the answer from the uh, from from the histology, and they found that those people with a history of insomnia uh, and those without a history of insomnia had equal difficulty in initiating and maintaining sleep and prolonged and, and frequent awakenings uh, uh, up to the point in which they got their results of their biopsy. But that those people with uh, a history of insomnia, that that difficulty in initiating sleep persisted way beyond getting the results. If, even if it was negative, even if it was negative, and uh, you know, I, I I I I bring this up because at the end we're going to talk about the the a little bit about what the guy talked at at the at the AASM plenary about emotional memory and about the mechanisms in the brain that either dampens down memories or dampens down uh, or enhances bad experiences. So. Um, predisposing leads to perpetuating conditions. So disease factors, treatment factors, medications, environmental factors, psychosocial disturbances, physical disorders. So I, mean, I think if, if we take care of sleep, uh, and, and then you have to remember that at one point uh, with treatment of breast cancer, okay, it took a person who was uh, premenopausal and instantly made them postmenopausal, and so you could you could you, 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 you kind of had to deal with whatever that climacteric changes were in sleep were occurring intentionally and it could be identified as a, as a, at a point in time. So there's biodirectional stuff. You got a theme here, right? That's, OSA or central sleep apnea, 20% of patients with OSA have comorbid insomnia. And they, they this was surprising. They said more severe in, in sleep apnea. I added an upper airway resistance syndrome because I think that there's no evidence for this. And I couldn't find the reference most recently, but these are the, these are the, uh, the ones from 2005, 2004, because I had that slide. And I think uh, the and insomnia is a presenting symptom in many people, uh, many 20% of the patients with OSA in single center studies. And they don't get diagnosed before, mood problems were not formally addressed, and um, central sleep apnea is much less common. And the, the kind of the, the clinical saw is the, is the person that has insomnia, is older, is thinner, has atrial fibrillation, is, is the person that's going to have a central sleep apnea. So, Sheila, any, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing for me is always sort of, I'm always surprised by these studies where they are looking for only insomnia. And so they just do screening questionnaires for sleep apnea and right. they don't find any high risk, but when they actually do a sleep study, they find that the prevalence of sleep apnea is rather high, which sort of makes you wonder about the bi-directionality. Yep. Is so my voice soft? There we are, we got that, we are. We, we have it's a little button. I checked that button. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Okay. Yeah. COPD patients. Um, boy, I, I'll tell you, you know, the pulmonary critical care, our colleagues would go crazy if we made them look at insomnia in that group. 
they're still they're going on trying to remodel the distal airways with new drugs. <laughs> they're going, give me a break. <laughs> give me a break. Sleep? Sleep? Well, that's because they just then they go off and they they do every third night in the units or every, every chronic nights. Now, are these uh, uh, corticosteroids is the one that I always think about. Uh, it used to be theophylline was a big one, but corticosteroids, 20% of people giving a burst of steroids for asthma will have insomnia. And some of them really benefit from having a sleeping medication at the same time until they finish their, finish their course. I have not talked to a, a hardcore asthma person. Uh, I know the kids get hyperactive, which, which I think is uh, part of that as well. Okay. Smoking, hypoxemia. Now, there's the there. There was another study by uh, Roth in the in the '90s. Took narcolepsy patients, COPD patients, and OSA patients, and uh, he took them. And what he did is what he was trying to find out is is hypoxia a cause of sleepiness? And everybody was saying, well, in narcolepsy, of course it's not, right? Of course it's not. Sleep deprivation, of course it's not. Then you go, okay, that's right. Okay, sleepiness. Here's a real hardcore sleep disorder. So now I have COPD and they spend a lot, not on oxygen, they spend tons of their time below an oxygen saturation of 90. Are they sleepy? And they went, no. And then he did uh, sleep apnea and found that they were sleepy. And you say, what does that mean? Well, I don't necessarily think that hypoxemia produces sleepiness, but I could be wrong. That's of course in all the reviews, it must be their nocturnal hypoxemia is the reason for their insomnia. But I, I, we, we can quibble about that. Predictor of hypertension. And we know that sleep apnea can predict hypertension, but uh, it's interesting that uh, insomnia itself, the, the difficulty initiating sleep and difficulty maintaining sleep and again, this is a, another one of those uh, you know, big surveys using telephones and things of that sort. And these are associations. So these were follow up for four years until development of hypertension. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Short sleep duration, hypertension from the Haynes one and uh, sleep art health study. So the reference was sleeping seven to eight hours. And then it was whether you had hypertension and more than nine hours, you had a little more, less than five. Interesting. Relationships between obesity and sleep disorders. And obviously that's, that's, we know that. And all these things, impaired glucose tolerance, diabetes, decreased insulin resistance, leptins, cholesterol, those by themselves have been linked to the creation of obesity and the generation and propagation of obesity over time. And those are things that also, at least the impaired glucose tolerance and the increased in insulin resistance with, with short sleep. Management. Now I'm not gonna go into a lot of this, and, uh, but uh, if you were talking to a primary care doc, Kupfer and Reynolds, New England Journal of Medicine, 1997, is sort of the, the stake in the ground for, uh, for people. These are not the traditional sleep. These are psychiatry people that really wrote that article in New England Journal of Medicine. Treat any underlying causes promote good sleep habits. And then in our practice, emphasize and initiate behavioral approaches, cognitive behavioral therapy is more durable and effective compared to a drug. So this was 1997. And we've, since then there have been more studies that, that, that have shown that, but they kind of said on the basis of very little data that that's what you should think about. And in the next uh, two years, uh, uh, 
Roth says after that paper in 1999 versus well, 2000 versus 1990 is that uh, prescri prescription sleeping pills increased from something like a billion dollars to sort of like 2.2 billion dollars. And the institution of three new sleeping pills occurred in the 1990s. So that's that's was the answer. First, good hygiene. They, I, I don't think I like to use that, but that's what they wanted. We know this. Not you know, commit to not be. I will not be watching the clock. I won't use stimulants. I won't eat heavy meals. I won't. I, you know, I will avoid exposure. Will enhance my sleep environment. We probably don't ask about sleep environment as much. And if we did, uh, we'd probably be surprised. Um, we have a questionnaire that we tried to pull out and we, we just never got over the hump to ask our veterans where they sleep because informally about 20% sleep in recliners. Um, and that's, that's, that was, that's sort of interesting. They sleep in recliners and often it's in their uh, living room and it's also in front of their TV. And that's the reason they can't use their CPAP because their CPAP's upstairs next to the bed. So, behavioral techniques. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the, is the, is the, so I think, what is it? Is it sleep restriction is the only other one that had at one time a uh, control, a placebo controlled trial? I think so. And there are people who have tried to go through each of these individually and say in a, in a, in a randomized control trial, see which one makes the biggest difference. Uh, in terms of the overall concept of the field, Sabina, is there is there any particular uh, particular thing or, 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 or thinking about? There's definitely been. Um more studies and greater emphasis on sleep restriction as a treatment on its own, even before considering CBTI as a package. Um, and then I would say after that is stimulus control, trying to keep them out of the bed when they're not sleeping. And then after that, it was the long, um, more complicated chronic cases. That's where a lot of the cognitive uh, components come in. So I probably told you this before, but I was I was in a book uh, used whenever I go to I used to go to meetings or things have time I go to a used bookstore and look for anything they had on sleep, and they had one on uh, psychology of sleep, but it was a general psychology book, and they had a case study from 1953 and 1954 from the guys that invented sort of behavioral therapy. And they had two examples. One that was an insomnia patient, and, and he said he took a long time trying to figure out what their what their wishes were, their unresolved wishes were, what their, were their unresolved problems. And one guy it was that he really wanted to have time to clean the floors in his apartment. He had one, he had beautiful, apparently beautiful wood floors, and they just really hadn't been cleaned in many years. Like I said, don't sleep, just clean your floors. He said the guy came back a week later and he said, sleeping plus. So we don't go in for unresolved wishes anymore. So I don't think so. Maybe you do. Maybe that's it. I'm sure that the other side is, is unresolved, scary things that happen. Drugs, and these are this is an old slide. Uh, you know, look at all these things. Domain we don't use anymore. I don't really think it's available. Older to the newer ones. Um, the major thing on that is their half lives and what they would do to try to keep people asleep. Antidepressants for insomnia. There's no data really that's, that's there. Insomnia. Uh, and trazodone has one, and, and I think there's maybe a couple more, but at one point it was used, but the only control uh, 
placebo control trial was the insomnia after uh, alcohol rehabilitation, and that it helped insomnia and it prevented relapse with alcohol. So that would be something that uh, I, I would think, you know, for instance, uh, partnering with people in, in this Connor Health thing, Sushi, so would be trying to get them to, they have a big group that say that they're researching. They have a, a paid pay, pay PhD research. Tricyclics, SSRIs, they ask you often. You know, board questions. Um, and this was a slide set that uh, was probably six or seven years ago. The low dose sedating was in it. Um, that's not been, that's not generally known. You'll hear about that more when you talk to, uh, when you go to the VA and talk to, to uh, Mom. Pharmacotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy persisted in some. So the decrease in sleep latency is greater in cognitive behavioral therapy, pharmacologic, a little bit less in terms of uh, sleep onset. Wake after sleep is less. So and, and the problem the what people point to is even if it's equivalent, that in all the studies in which pharmacologic treatment has been used, so you've stopped the pharmacologic treatment, is that there are symptoms, their condition comes back. And so, from the point of view of, 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 of really changing something in an underlying condition, that the the cognitive behavioral therapy is more durable. So it, it persists beyond the last visit. And that that particular is something you can fall back on. And I think that's uh, that's generally what uh, the right answer is on the board is cognitive behavioral therapy. And the second is uh, more durable, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. So edgy. So what should a primary care provider provide in a referral to a sleep clinic? And so we know we need to work on this. Because what you would like is you would like a really informed referral. Say, I want to do this. Instead of evaluate and treat, right? Absolutely. My referrals right now is my primary care won't fill my ambient anymore and they want me to meet with you instead. That's the majority of my primary care referrals right now. Yep. So I don't know if we can expect this to happen, but if we had an intake and we had some way of going back and forth in the EMR or through my uh, healthy chart, to patients, that we'd be able to have a, a little kind of cheat sheet that we would have. Maybe we shouldn't have it as we go in to see the patient. I'm all for sort of open-ended questions when people are referred to the sleep clinic. For instance, you know, you're in a sleep clinic, well, how can I help you? Why were you referred? What are the sorts of issues that you think you want to fix in the next three, four, or five? Right, not, not tomorrow, right? Because it's not cancer. It's not the uh, nocturnal angina. It's not that sort of thing. And then maybe we would have a little sheet that would come up in the middle saying, oh, remember this guy has bipolar disorder. Remember this guy has this guy. Yeah. But. And a lot of the QAs and EMR orders, there's like a drop down box, you know. Right. For like, yeah, well, that's a you know that that's to restrict access. You know, cardiology and the VA does that. They have like two pages. You, know, you don't answer one question, so well, well, you need to answer the question. So we don't we're not responsible for that. Referral. You can do a short one, be like do a short one, really short. Right. 
Yeah, but I don't know if free text is a, you know, you guys have been closer to the primary care. I mean, they really want to know. I guess what it is is maybe the consult can pull in diagnoses like this into the consult rather than what we have now, which, which just comes up and says, please ask for does this or something like that. Well, I wonder if you could say, you know, what a reasonable prayer is on me. So what do we treat? Uh, sleep apnea, restless legs, parasomnias, circadian rhythms, or There are only two that really generally require laboratory testing. So I want to go on just a little bit to talk about what's the next frontier for sleep medicine for for insomnia and for these sorts of, of, of sleep disorders. And I think the remote referrals are, you got to figure out what the right balance is between in-person and remote, and whether it's a blended model or whether it's a reinforced model. And there's a recent one in Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine that says that, uh, that a uh, cognitive behavioral approach can be done by just a Computer and AI just as well as if they see our AI person, which is Selena, right? It's your, it's your cognitive, it's your, it's your kidneys for you. And then enter the uh, personal sleep history assessment beyond that and rule out all standard emergency person. Use our, tech, our technology to assess functional rate. And I've, I've been You know, I think our field has that opportunity because I don't see neurology doing it. I certainly don't see psychiatry doing it, but we're really a brain disorder system. And probably we should be able to use our technology to do more brain stuff and not uh, allow radiology and MRIs would not allow uh, other people to take over that particular field. Now, I know I'm not the only one. And I'm also one of the few that there are people in psychiatry and neurology that say we will, we will, we will take over this area and the psychiatry is using the uh, TEMS, that is the, the stimulation with multiple electrodes in the brain to treat depression and go on to treat uh, insomnia with that as well. And uh, those machines uh, are, you get the machine and the caps that you have to buy. So we'll see. So let's go through a couple of those things. So this was what the, one of the slides that the, the, the guy who, who gave the plenary uh, at the AASM. This was one of the first things he put up. And, and he put this up to say, I want to remind people that insomnia patients, which are the ones in the bottom, have a different polysomnography than control patients. They may have the same absolute time in RAM, or absolute time in N2, or absolute time in N3. But what they're characterized is more state shifts, more arousals, more fragmentation, more, uh, more things that are happening at a almost micro level. And, um, and his particular point was then, and this was why like his second or third slide, at his end of his talk, he focuses back on REM sleep, but in particular, REM and his fragmentation. Now, these are, I think, automatically uh, uh, scored studies in which the criteria for REM sleep, uh, you can see that there could be fragmented uh, down below. You see when this fragmented REM sleep occurs, there's nothing in N1, N2, or N3. So, are these all arousals or whatever they are? But these are the, the state changes that are occurring within REM sleep. 
So Kingman, you think we should be scoring in 30 second epochs? Well, I think we should be looking for these things. And let me tell you what I think we need to be paying attention to. And, and, uh, and uh, if John's still on there, you know, he's the one that we got. Yes, I am. Only a few people in neurophysiology that look at these things and see these things. And their neural networks kind of go through the PSG differently than people who are trained in pulmonary medicine. Right, John? Yeah, who was the, I keep thinking about, it was, I, I can't remember who it was, it was um, uh, somebody we had on, they, they did like, um, might've been from New England that they did like this great EEG analysis and, and like really mapped out everything, yeah, well, you know, well, Michael, during the night. Michael Decker does that uh, for his work. He has a 128 or electrode array he can measure at the same time he does functional MRI. And he can get better temporal resolution than a functional MRI for resting brain networks and for things that change. And this is what this guy was focusing on in his introductory talk at the AASM. I've got more data on it, but this is how he started. He just said, look, you know, that, that, that insomnia is a brain disease, it's a brain problem. And so let me go through what Ruth Benka and the people at, uh, at, at Wisconsin did. Well, you know, they had their, their major thing is that they had a, a bunch of people that were interested in, in sleep as a window to consciousness, right? So what stage of sleep are you self-aware? What stages of sleep are we self-aware? Well, so uh, when you're, I would say REM sleep. Yeah, all right. So you're, you're self-aware during wakefulness and during REM sleep. Now, you're not completely the same, but you're walking down the street or this is coming at you. It's not, you know, it's not, you know, like it's not Zach. Zach is coming to me. It's not that I'm seeing Zach like in a movie. It's not like a movie. It's very personal. And, and that, you know, and, and Chinomi and, and, uh, and those guys are really looking at consciousness. And that's where they, so that's that 128 electrode array in the upper left. So that's what it is, right? They put lights on people, high density EEG, TMS studies, health and disease. They use 256 electrodes recorded. Now we have a TEMS unit actually do we have we have we got one over at the VA and, and no one and, and, and it's sort of like uh, been uh, it, it's the second system that they have downstairs with Michael Decker. Don't tell him. But these caps you can put on people's heads now. And then they had light, and you notice what that is. That's a near infrared spectroscopy to look at the oxygen, to look at oxygen in, in the brain. Um, all sorts of little things. So, what do you do here? High density EEG in sleep can be done routinely, non invasively, and relatively inexpensively. Could be done with standard PSG has largely been done. You don't necessarily have to have 128 electrode array, but you probably need to have more than you know what we usually do. It's not the minimalist approach. So sleep apnea PSG likely to migrate to home range. Spatial resolution is comparable to a pet. It is. The temporal resolution is ideal. It's much better than. Sleep is a window on spontaneous brain function and broad patient populations to be amenable and look at this. I'll get this out of the way for you, John. Connection to long-term epilepsy work, right? So these are resting brain, brain networks. And so spontaneous brain rhythms during sleep reflect brain functioning unconfounded by attentional and motivational. 
And these spindle-like activities have always been really very interesting to people, especially the, and it, it comes in waves, it comes with spindle interest in waves. It comes like the Italians with, with, uh, with the, their particular looking at the, the, the waves of fast activity and slow activity that occurs in the sea. And the spindle activity is really a, quite, is, 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 is at its core, the thalamocortical connections. And so when you start to say, well, what, what is happening? And you can see that they, they what the, the red and the blue and all that are things that are active and inactive. Uh, and what they do. So sleep slow wave activity is homeostatically regulated throughout the cortex. That is, it, it, goes, it kind of goes back and forth and back and forth over time. If, I, you know, I just don't, I, I don't see that when I look at our electrode arrays, you know, frontal lobes, central lobes, and parietal or occipital. And I don't look at it over that period of time of even eight seconds. Or, what, so 30 second epochs, fine. Maybe we should look at 10 seconds. Yeah, so it's totally different when you're looking at EEGs because I read EEGs every day. And, and then, you know, when I look at sleep studies, it's like, well, it's just a, it's just a, it's, it, it's just a totally different view. And it's, 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 it's very, it would be very difficult over, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, six to eight hours to sort of read all this and get this information on every single patient. That would be really hard. Well, sleep, uh, sleep med, I don't know what it's called now. Their particular software allows you to do frequency analysis every, every four seconds. And it could display it at a minute interval or a two minute interval every four seconds. You could probably distinguish these peaks and valleys. I don't know if you know our new system can do that. Me and code. Do we do we have the capability at UH? We must we must be able to do high density EEG at UH. Well, they don't. They, the only place that they would deploy it would be an epilepsy monitoring. Right now, that's uh, in disarray. That's just a that's just a uh, you know that's just a clinical service and. and do we get enough margin? That's all it is. Not, not, no, no curiosity about it at all. In fact, they measure oxygen saturation and then send us to diagnose OSA, even though they had them in, in the, they had them under their, under their visible eye for, for how many hours? 72 hours. And they said, they said, we think they might have sleep apnea. You go, wait a second, you probably could have told us. If they snore, if they have apneas, and how many they have, and they sleep during the day, you know all that stuff. And they go, well, oh, that's not part of what we do. Yeah, it's 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 interesting you you mentioned that because for a while I've been thinking, you know, they're collecting insane amounts of detailed sleep data that we never access. Well, the guy, the, the guy that went down to Houston that was here, uh, Doctor Latou. Well, too, I, you know, he, when he first came here, he came and talked to me and asked me how he could set up this, this national system. I, I gave him what we had done in, as a program project grant and how we could do that. But he, he was getting those guys together. And there were people there. He, he, and, and we made some fairly interesting observations. If you look at his articles on, on things like bradycardia and epilepsy and breathing and oxygen saturation and the value and the, the danger of benzodiazepines in those people that had epilepsy. So if you have epilepsy and you have benzos on board, you're likely to have a pretty severe bradycardia and, and fall in oxygen saturation that probably was from the rigidity of having a procedure itself. So he got to that point, but and he had somebody there, but, but the hospital certainly was interested in having that somebody else was paying for. But since somebody else was paying for it, the, the big R word goes on the clinical guy's forehead, you know, 
He's doing research. Okay. Anyway, that's, I'm going to go through this. Slow waves originally more frequently in the orbital spiral and central regions to propagate anterior, posterior direction. And this is uh, in the board. It's in the boards of half. You know, how do you how do you how do you propagate slow waves? Sleep spindle activity is reduced in schizophrenia. So have automatic ways of detecting spindles or looking at spindles. We, we sit there and mainly we look at spindles and we say, gee, there are a lot of spindles on the end benzos, right? And, and then we look at the frequency and say, yeah, they're probably on benzos. But, you may, you know, but we don't diagnose schizophrenia, but we can see where I'm going with this. Is we probably can do all sorts of things. Slow wave op op uh, oscillations can be triggered by this, this TMS. Can we deepen sleep using TMS? Can we take, can we do this sort of stuff? I've been trying to see if we could organize that over uh, at the VA, because uh, they have it for, they have a couple of things for treatment. Bigman, has there been much uh, looking at cooling recently? You know, I know there was a period of time people were looking at cooling the brain as a way to yeah, no, they're doing that too. They're doing that too, and then the other is insomnia. Yeah, but you know, it's it's really I put the thing on their head, and do they have less insomnia complaints? It doesn't really say what the EEG activity is underneath. Although there are people who have measured it, it's just that that's not the selling point. That's not how they can sell it to the VA. Oh, look, these EEG changes are there. So slow oscillation. Spindle. Now this thing, sharp wave ripple complexes, high frequency ripples. I hadn't even heard this term before, John. Neither did I. <laughs> it's new to me. <laughs> I'd have to. I'd have to like. Generated in the hippocampus. I mean, that means that we're seeing stuff that we know can be isolated into a part of the brain. That's really cool. I mean, I think it's, but I also think, and so this is what this guy was talking about. He was saying, look, this, these sharp wave ripple complexes, especially in the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is, you know, the PGL waves that originate and start right before REM sleep start in the hippocampus. And so we got the hippocampus, oh, we got stuff going on in the hippocampus. And so this is sort of like, these are these neocortical slow oscillations, these fast spindles and slow spindles. So I'm going to get John looking at these EEGs a lot differently. He's going to spend it. He's going to spend an extra two minutes on a PSG. How about that? Yeah, ab absolutely. This is uh, you know I, I want to call epilepsy and see if we could access some of this. Oh, they they love you to look at it. It's just the whether they have anybody that's able to access. It. So if you modify spindle density, uh, uh, density, you can change verbal memory. You can look at and motor learning and verbal learning and motor learning. And it's really in a way that you really don't anticipate. And verbal learning goes up with the result of it. it goes down with sodium oxide. I have to find the references. But that was with this, this guy that gave the lecture. That's why I. I Look at his lecture two or three times. What I'm talking about whether we would, you know, what what that really means in terms of schedule balance. I'm almost done. Can the sleep lab be a place to test for memory, right? It's quiet, it's away from distractions, remote. You know, it's Resting brain state and interconnection with high density EEG, assessments of fatigue and insomnia, COVID CNS complaints, CFS, fibromyalgia. That's what uh, Michael Decker did before he got his Air Force grades. He looked at fibromyalgia, looked at resting brain states, and activity before and after graded exercise. And then testing before and after treatment for fatigue and insomnia. 
And then this is the other thing he was talking about. That really insomnia is, is occurring because, uh, and Samina, you might like that Samina's off, but I'll send this. Recall distress, right? <clears throat> And so in this particular one, they had gave them a distress before sleep. Then they measured their sleep, and you can see the fragmented REMs of the current inside. And then they gave them that new distress that they had had before, and looked at their functional MRI and found that the areas in the new distress were, the brain was much more activated in the insomnia patient. It was as if they remembered that new distress more. And then they were asked to, recall the distress that they had had some 10, 15 years ago. It was emotionally contact. And um, the people that didn't have insomnia recalled that and they didn't really activate it. But the people with insomnia activated it. So it was the idea that you can activate long-term emotional regulation was occurring in REM sleep. And then you could either regulate it up or down. So you can even see triggered REM sleep modification, especially if you, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you can consolidate REM sleep, which you can with tones, you can do with noise in your ear. So finally, memory trace plasticity and overnight distress adaptation. That's the big, that's the big thing that's true. And this, this is the idea of the predisposing factors, gene variants, early life stress, change your brain circuits, precipitating factors, and perpetuating factors. And you've got vulnerability, you've got uh, consequences. A, it, 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 I think the major thing to think of is that each of these factors in insomnia, predisposing precipitation, perpetual, have uh, features in it that we can probably look at. So, this is just the model that. Uh, that they were going to use in, in Wisconsin before Ruth Baker moved to California to try to use uh, uh, for insomnia, furrow based practice, improve access, standardized assessment, and outreach. So once they had their act together inside the world. Okay, the laboratory. And then um, they read them the next morning, but that's because they value the reads and so people who actually uh, you know, that's what they do imagine if we uh, we said uh, we said we read them the next morning they do that at Mayo Clinic but they have to at Mayo Clinic because people are coming from elsewhere from overseas and people just you know, send you know, the sleep study they read them the next day so you need sleep out at 11 o'clock in the morning and sleep out the And then they, uh, they sleep on it for the rest of the couple nights in the, in the hospital or wherever they get worked up for their, their annual health thing or whatever it is. That's a, that's a real boutique approach. So you show that, Sushil, you show that to people. And, and you say, we're going to read them the next morning. They go, great, go read them the next morning. You say, but that means you can't have clinic. Well, maybe that's a good idea. Morning sleep clinics are usually not very well. <laughs> <laughs> not very well attended. But uh, you need to have a group that really knew it. So you can't have a distributed set system. I mean, you can, you can do it electronically. You could say, okay, that means that people are sitting there reading studies. So we would have a fellow do a rotation on there, at least in a rotation, it would be a reading <coughs> fellow every morning, right? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Because you know, we're other things. I mean, we're, at the Cleveland Clinic, they read on, uh, they, they read over a thousand studies during their fellowship. They read on Monday from when they first learning how to do it. They don't leave until all the ones are done. So they're reading in July and August. They're reading until one o'clock in the morning. 
Thanks. I don't think you can read sleep studies that way. Yeah. Now we've uh we've decided not to do it. Okay, so it's not clear. Any comments here? Was it what was it? Was this okay? I thought you said it wasn't gonna be a deep diet. A deep diet? Well, I mean at the end you can you, know, you can always fall asleep when it starts your you know, 256 away eating views. But I knew the John would. John would stay away. Yeah, he, he he slept through the first half, right, John? That's correct. Then all of a sudden I said EEG it turns 56. And then challenge him to do it with three leads in his current lab laboratory. Huh? You know, do you think that there will be an opportunity, you know, in your cell phone? Uh, you can buy an app and it will tell you what your heart rate is over time, or it will tell you what this. Do you think that there will be apps that will be put into the, into the, the PSG software? Do you think that we could get this PN code to, to actually export it here using a European file format into an app that would then allow you to? Identify spindle density or spindle frequency over across the whole thing. I mean, little things. I mean, I, I mean, they must do it with EEG, right? Oh, I know they do, but then, but they would sit there and say, "Oh, that's proprietary." Well, Apple says it's proprietary, but they love it when you do all sorts of apps, right? I think it. I, mean, I think it's, I mean, it's worth the ask for sure. I mean, well, the worst. I, mean, I think we just try to get somebody that's one of these, you know. You know, the high school kid who knows how to do apps and, and signals and sit there and write it and sit there and say, look what we did. And, and you know, we have to ask them nicely, can we get the, where, where can we export the file as a European file format? And then the next question is, how can we do it in real time? And then how can we do that? Because we could, we could have our own, I think it's possible. I mean, when I look at the cell phone, I look and I say, well, I want a, a sleep app. There are 40 of them. And so I pay $2 for the lady that made it. And you know, that's a short slide saying, I'm just going to buy the, the amplifiers. I'm just going to buy this thing. I'm going to set them up. That's what we used to do in the 80s. I'm going to be able to have a recording device. And then I'm going to have all these plug in apps that will analyze this thing. And I don't even need your software. Right. I I'm gonna have to cut out because I have I have to see patients in Medina. I know, I know. I just, I'm glad you could stay around. We're, we're done. So, we're thanks. Done. We'll see you. Okay. Okay. See you later, guys. Bye. Oh, you gotta go over there and yell at this lady. I'll go over and start. Yeah. Just wondering. Uh, yeah. Just referring to the way you were saying, like looking at looking at most. Uh, Disease states and disease processes, and how things evolve. The one thing I see in the near future, I mean, I don't know if this is already being done, is separating out, identifying and being able to separate out the phenotypes. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. So, Did you, I'll set you a slide. I don't think I was doing Everybody does. It's all these different, a whole group of, of people with this on, and they all do their regular stuff. And then it's called a star nine. So if you have lots of problems, it's a big number. And if you have small problems, it's a, it's a small number. And so you put all 15 symptoms into the star nine. And you can see with these things. And then you put in what is a, a circadian rhythm insomnia, what is rare insomnia, what's insomnia is due to drugs, what's this, that, and the other. And you see the subtle change in the star that is in and the bigger the star, the more the sun, but it's not in all domains for all people. But that'd be interesting because I mean, it would be great if you could identify based on just some questions and maybe certain specific testing in terms of who would be more responsive to medication. Yeah. We make a movie for people with questions, and then we have to look through each one. Imagine if you had this big display, just bam, and you say, huh. 
and the same thing for sleep apnea. Oh, this is a this is a hypoventilation because it's hypoxia and we got a portion of the day being shot, right? Or this is a, and the symptoms there are are, are more sleepiness than they are something else, right? And that means more cardiovascular. I mean, I think that's where the, where the field is. But the, the whole trick is displaying the data, all that data, in a way that you can make a decision that is informative to outcome. Yeah. So the four pathways for sleep apnea, do you like to be able to know? So you don't want to try to narrow it. Right. If, if you like to know what it is, you say, well, I think it's a peak crit problem. So this, I think it's a I think it's P crit plus a little or P crit plus a muscle. And, and then you'll be able to sort of figure out. And you know, just as much, you know, the thing is that's so frustrating is we're a small field and we're not terribly well regarded from, from as, because we're outpatient based and because we take care of sleep, right? And that, so there's a automatically, and they don't know this. 256 one, right? Have you ever heard of that stuff? Wow, right? And here's a board certified neurologist there talking about that I'm showing this to me. Go, wow, right? I'm going, I'm just a poor country bowler, you know? <laughs> here, here, we got we got an internist that gets it faster than, than other people that, that does this. And so we sit there and we go. But you look at other fields, and you know, they're just screaming. They, they, they're trying to build up their chops. I mean, that's kind of what they call it. Oh, it's not just CO2. Right? It's CO2. This is CO2. That is CO2. It's, 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 it's reactivity and non reactivity. It's remodeling the airway. It's how do I read re remodeling? Yeah, you, have to, right? you have to make things scientific, but that's I think one thing which I've noticed, especially with asthma. That asthma the last 10 years has evolved to a field that people thought that no one was anything to do, but now they have allergic people type, non allergic people type, right. they have biologic agents. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, okay, they know what they're doing. Well, so it's one well, I, I walk in and do a consult over there you now, or every you know, other part of the planet, and I hear these guys talking, and I'm going, oh, I read the chart, and that's exactly what they do. And, and, and of course, if they're not an allergic feeding type, they'll still get any allergic stuff. Yeah, there are too many acidophils in the peripheral blood. I'll get it, right. <laughs> man, I, I, you go, oh man, and they won't do the study. I mean, is it, are they using the inhaler? Are they doing this? You know, how do you decontaminate the house? What do you do this? You know, all this. Stuff. It all comes down to the same things at the end, but. You know, I think it's just part of the evolution of every field that we become more detail oriented. Yeah. I think that's where the people start to get serious. Okay, I'll send this around. Although I don't know if I have those slides in that school.